Hey students, welcome back. We are going to get into American Revolution Chapter 5, Part 3. This is the final in a three-part series on the American Revolution. So here we have the key terms that we are going to be discussing today. We're going to start by some of the financial difficulties that the American Revolution is causing the colonists. Then we're going to give a nod to some of the women um, in the Revolutionary War. Then we're going to move on to talk about some of the battles of the Revolutionary War, and then the final battle, of course, the Battle of Yorktown, and the treaty that comes out of this war, the Treaty of Paris of 1783. Remember what I said about those treaties of Paris. You want to always make sure that you know the date. So the Treaty of Paris of 1783 is the one that ends the Revolutionary War, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 is the one that ends the French and Indian War. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is this financial instability and corruption that the American Revolution is really creating for the colonies. So the Continental Congress had decided to print money to cover the costs of the war. But within a few short years, its value deteriorated because the Congress had no reserves or goal of gold or silver to back up the currency, as I said in the last lecture. Soon the Congress had to resort to other means to procure supplies and labor. One of them method was to borrow hard money from wealthy men um, who were given in exchange certificates of debt promising repayment with interest. This becomes known as the IOU problem after the American Revolution. So during the entire American Revolution, essentially the Second Continental Congress is borrowing, borrowing, borrowing money um, with the promise to repay, but with the promise to repay with interest. Um, and so you, this is causing, this will cause a major debt after the American Revolution. Uh, you notice here this is a dollar, a, what's known as a continental dollar. So this is an example of the type of dollar that would have been printed at the time, used as currency during the American Revolution. So you can see this is one third of a dollar. It's basically a print printed on a piece of paper and you have to believe that this thing is worth something um, when you accept this as currency. So, of course, inevitably, um, Americans are going to suffer because this will lead to raising raised prices um, because there is uh, interest, um, a de devaluation of the currency. So there's price inflation. And the wartime economy, it's unreliable currency, price inflation, this was extremely demoralizing to Americans. And so inevitably, Americans turn to unsuitable situation to their advantage and, and a brisk black market in prohibited luxury imports soon sprang up. So, you know, the American colonists had gotten really accustomed to certain products and the fact that um, products were now so expensive and that there, there was a devaluation of their currency, this is creating a lot of discontent. So some people are going to decide, okay, well, we still want our goods, so we are going to go ahead and engage in this black market um, activity that was happening, which essentially was that you know illegal goods were being brought into the American colonies. Um, this type of behavior was um, undermining also the economy of the colonies at the time period as well. Um, and had you gotten caught engaging in this type of activity, it would, you would have been punished with at least imprisonment. Okay, so now we're going to talk about women and the Revolutionary War. So I've already talked about women in their capacity as the camp followers, right? As nurses, as cooks, as um, launderers, right? So people who are supporting the troops as camp followers. But there were some who went a step further. Um, some actually worked as spies and some actually fought in the Revolutionary War. 
Probably the most famous of these women was a woman by the name of Deborah Sampson. Uh, she disguised herself as a man to serve in the war, and she actually served for 17 months um, under the name Robert Shirtliff. And um, she was eventually wounded, and her, her gender identity was actually discovered by the doctor, but the doctor kept it a secret so that um, she could be honorably discharged and eventually she will get a war pension for her service in, 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 in the Revolutionary Army. Uh, Margaret Corbin, who is another example of these remarkable women, um, was the wife of a man by the name of John Corbin and he fought in Washington's army and in November of 1776 um, during that big long retreat from Long Island, um, George John Corbin was hurt and his wife ended up taking over and fighting for him um, on the field in a combat role. Nancy Hart was a woman who was very large. She was six feet tall, which was huge for a woman back then. And she lived on the Georgia frontier. So she's way down in the South. And she worked for the Continental Army as a spy. And so she would dress as a man and go into the British camps and gather information and then relay it back to the Continental Army. And then my final example of remarkable women during the Revolutionary War period um, is a woman by the name of Mercy Otis Warren. Um, she worked as sort of more of an intellectual supporter of the war. Um, she was a political writer. Um, she was a propagandist, so she wrote, um, you know, pro-American pamphlets. Um, she advocated um, towards the end of the war for a constitution that contained a Bill of Rights. And eventually she will write a history of the American Revolution. Um, so it was unusual for a woman to really sort of step into those types of intellectual roles and analysis roles. Um, back in, you know, the 18th century. So Mercy Warren was unique in that way and certainly did support the revolution in that way as well. So a lot of women did help behind the scenes, raising money, um, supporting the troops, but some women like the examples that I just gave sort of went above and beyond, putting them, themselves in the line of combat, you know, to fight for the revolutionary cause. So we can see that this was really sort of this impassioned cause. Remember that 40% of people that really, really felt strongly about this, um, included in those 40%, obviously, were also women. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about a very critical battle in the Revolutionary War called the Battle of Saratoga. The Battle of Saratoga was actually fought in two separate battles. Um, one was actually a British victory, but the second was an American victory. And this becomes a really a turning point, a critical, critical victory for the Americans in the uh, Revolutionary War. So you have General John Burgoyne, and he is coming down from the north, um, down the Hudson River Valley, with an army of about 7,800 uh, men, right? Um, and General Howe, who is also British general, stationed in New York, um, had promised Burgoyne that he was actually going to come up from New York to help him um, in this battle that they anticipated would take place around Saratoga. What, what the British were trying to do is they were trying to take the city of Albany. Um, but the battle it actually takes place in Saratoga. And General Howe um, decides that instead of going north to help reinforce John Burgoyne's uh, army, that he is instead going to sail south and try to capture Philadelphia. Um, and so because of this decision, he really kind of leaves Burgoyne very vulnerable. Uh, meanwhile, okay, the Patriots, the Continental Army, are building up around Burgoyne, and they are cutting off 
his supply lines. Um, reinforcements um, that were supposed to come to help the British from the West were stopped by the Battle of Oriskany, which we will talk about in a minute. So essentially, Burgoyne and his armies is, um, is isolated. Um, and ultimately, it, they, he will be forced to surrender his army um, to the Americans. Now, this is critical because the British, part of the British military strategy was to take the Hudson River Valley because that would then allow for further isolation of New England. And because they were unable to do this, then the Americans are able to um, recover uh, their presence in the Hudson River Valley. But more importantly, Burgoyne's surrender in October of 1777 will lead to France agreeing to military and financial support of the American Revolution. So keep in mind, this war has been going on now for two years. There's been kind of this vague promise by the French for support somewhere down the road. And once they see that this very highly decorated, by the way, British General Burgoyne is forced to surrender to the Americans in the Battle of Saratoga, they realize that maybe the Americans have a fighting chance here. And at that point, the French decide that they are willing to risk sending military back up to help the Americans. Okay, so we can see here a blow up of the Battle of Saratoga, the Battles of Saratoga. So you can see here, uh, Burgoyne is coming down from the Canadian border, down through Lake Champlain. Um, they take um, Fort Ticonderoga in July of 1777. They continue on, they take Fort Anne, they take Fort Edward, and then there's this battle, right? So the first battle is September 19th. This is a battle that was a British victory. But then you have Horatio Gates and General Stark, who are both coming in um, to reinforce the Continental Army. And eventually Burgoyne will be forced to surrender after his defeat on October 7th. Um, he doesn't surrender right away. He's hoping that, you know, he's going to get some reinforcements um, from other places, either from the West or from the, from the South. Um, but that never happens. And the reason why he's forced to surrender is because his supply lines are are blocked. Um, and so his uh, army is essentially starving. So he's forced to surrender. But again, Battle of Saratoga, the victory at Saratoga, um, the fact that Burgoyne surrenders is a major victory for the Americans because the French then become involved in the war. So I mentioned when I was talking about the Battle of Saratoga, the Battle of Oriskany. Um, this happens the same year as the Battle of Saratoga, but a couple of months earlier in August of 1777. Um, this battle is notable for several reasons. Um, first off, it does stop the British from sending reinforcements to Burgoyne. So that's an important part. Um, it's also notable because it's a very um, multi-ethnic battle. So you've got German uh, militia groups um, from the colonies. You've got New York Patriots. You've got Oneida Indians. Um, uh, Mohawk warriors, um, set Hessians, right? So you've got these paid German mer mercenaries fighting against German American militia groups. You've got Oneida <coughs> um, Indians fighting Mohawk Indians, right? You've got New York Patriots uh, fighting British soldiers. So it's like this big conglomeration of all of these um, distinct groups, all of them really sort of wanting something different um, out of this battle and fighting for different reasons. Um, this was also a particularly brutal battle. About 500 plus patriots are killed or wounded um, and about 90 Mohawk warriors. It's, it's one of the bloodiest battles for the patriots um, in the entire war. 
um, the British are forced to retreat north. So they do, um, the Continental Army, the Patriots, do succeed in stopping the British advancement. But um, it is uh, also an important battle for the following reasons. So the Battle of Oriskany will dissolve the Iroquois Confederacy. So the Iroquois Confederacy was this remarkable group of five tribes that um, had these alliance systems with each other. Basically, they backed each other up. And the Iroquois Confederacy goes back to pre-contact. So it, it existed before Europeans arrived on the shores of New England. And the Iroquois Confederacy was basically um, located in New England, primarily in upstate New York, but in other areas as well. And the sad thing about the Battle of Oriskany is that once that Iroquois Confederacy is dissolved, right, it no longer, um, and, and that's because at the Battle of Oriskany, you've got all these different tribes fighting each other. Um, years of fighting will continue on the frontier. Um, and this will be not fighting, just fighting between settlers and Indians, but also Indians against other Indians. So what we're starting to see is the impact that the settlers are having on tribal relationships. And um, this is sort of very sad development and one of uh, the more lasting, um, sadder consequences of the Revolutionary War uh, for Native Americans. As I mentioned, the majority of the time, um, the Indian tribes will side with the British during the American Revolution with the hopes of, you know, stopping the advancement of settlers. Um, but not always. Sometimes um, the Indian tribes fought on the side of the Americans, which was one of the things that happened at the Battle of Oriskany, where you had one side fighting, um, you know, on the, alongside the Patriots and then the other side fighting um, alongside the British. And so again, this is causing divisions um, that are a lot more complicated than I think we give credit to when we just talk about the American Revolution being a uh, war against, you know, the colonists and the British. You always keep in mind that you have these other players in this war, um, the Native American tribes, um, the African American enslaved and free people, Right, uh, all of these different players are also involved in these conflicts. Okay, so here we have a map, and this will show this shows you the extent of the fighting of the Revolutionary War into these frontier regions. Um, so I was just talking about um, the Battle of Oriskany that happens up here outside of Fort Stanwix. Um, but you'll also notice that these battles are categorized in different ways. Um, you see here the blue explosion, that's an American victory. The red explosion is a British victory and the black explosion is an Indian victory. So you can see here that there's a really like a mix of different um, battles taking place. Um, and that Native people are really very much involved in a lot of these battles, particularly in this region where the Iroquois Confederacy um, lived. Um, so you see here these uh, outposts. And the other thing to keep in mind about this is that um, the, the, this, these complex um, sort of frontier relationships are going to continue after the end of the Revolutionary War. So even when the Revolutionary War ends, um, you are going to see continued conflict in the frontier um, between these different groups. So let me give you an example. Here we have Boonesboro. Borough. Um, this is a settler outpost that was uh, founded by Daniel Boone, the famous frontiersman. Right? And, he was one of the people that was bold enough to go out beyond um, the proclamation line and set up this settlement. Well, notice here that they are being attacked by some Shawnee, um, the native tribe, the Shawnee. Um, and that happens within the context of the Revolutionary War in 1778. But really what's happening is the Shawnee are using the, the, uh, the, the atmosphere of the Revolutionary War 
as a way to send a message to these settlers um, in Boonesboro that they are not welcome in this frontier region. So that's the kind of thing that after the war um, continues to be a problem, particularly for settlers um, who feel like they have been victimized by um, these various Native American tribes. Okay. So now we're going to turn our attention back to the eastern seaboard and we're going to talk about the fact that the British come into Philadelphia. So remember how when I was talking about the Battle of Saratoga that General Howe was supposed to go up and reinforce General Burgoyne's army. Well instead he decides to not do that um, and turn his attention to Philadelphia and he is going to basically um, take over the city of Philadelphia and the Continental Congress is going to get kicked out of Philadelphia for a period of time while the British occupy the city. Washington um, is going to have to retreat his army from Philadelphia and the surrounding area and they are going to hunker down for winter at Valley Forge. Now the winter of 1777 to 1778 was extreme. There was uh, storm after storm, there was lots of snowfall, and it was extremely cold. And this particular uh, Valley Forge makeshift fort um, that was erected um, was very inadequate for really um, sheltering the soldiers, and many, many um, died, um, over 2,000 soldiers die at Valley Forge and Washington's army that winter um, for lack of provisions, um, basically hypothermia, exposure, right? And um, this was, again, another one of those low points for Washington's army, similar to before the Battle of Trenton. Um, this is where, you know, he's really having to go around and try to keep the morale of his soldiers up. Um, it, he, he blamed um, the Americans, really the citizenry, um, for lack of support of this revolutionary cause. Um, and indeed, this, there was a lot of evidence that there was corruption, that there was profiteering, um, that some of the Americans just had very little interest, as I've already mentioned, in supporting the revolutionary cause. So it, it, it is very clear that um, Washington, and we know from his letters that came out of Valley Forge, that he was very frustrated, um, not just with the Continental Congress, but with the American people generally. Um, he does get a very important addition to his army over the winter at Valley Forge, and this was a man by the name of Frederick Wilhelm August Hendrik von Steuben, also just uh, referred to as v Baron von Steuben. Um, and this was a Prussian military officer, at least that's what he claimed to be, um, that came to Washington's camp at Valley Forge and offered his services. Um, and as the spring settled in and the ground began to thaw and the snow melted away, um, Baron von Steuben will start to train uh, Washington's army and build them up um, to fight yet again um, in the spring. Um, the other thing that the Americans had to go on um, at that hard winter in Valley Forge was the anticipation of the arrival of French support and French troops. Um, and so that kept um, morale up as well. Okay, so in February of 1778, um, a, an alliance between, a, an official alliance, a formal alliance, was signed between the Americans and the French. Um, the American, the French had been waiting for a promising American victory to justify a formal declaration of war, and they got that with the Battle of Saratoga. But the French had been providing 
aid to the Americans in the form of war material and advisors um, all the way back to 1776. The main attraction, of course, for the fr French in this alliance was the opportunity to simply defeat England, right? The French and the English, they're, you know, classic enemies of each other. But the French support materialized very slowly. Um, some Americans began to grumble whether or not it would even be worth having the French support. But it turns out that it will be an indispensable uh, component to the American victory. Um, more importantly for the United States, for the, for the Congress, and by Congress I'm talking about the Second Continental Congress, which is still the functioning government during the Revolutionary War, um, it, for them, it gave them an excuse to begin to be more aggressive about getting money. Um, and so they ask the colonies for a tax. Um, they want to be able to try to build up uh, their war effort. They, um, they begin to seize and sell loyalist property. Um, so they become a lot more aggressive in that way. But despite all of those things, um, the financial problems continue. Um, the continental dollar remains devalued. Inflation remains high. Prices remain high. Black markets continue um, to function. And the country still remains in debt. Okay, so we are going to turn now to the southern um, phase, the southern phase of the American Revolution. So when French, France joined the war, some British officials actually wondered out loud whether or not this fight was worth continuing. Um, the British understood that once the French got involved, that the Americans would have a lot more access to military supplies and that they would also have access to a navy. The king, however, was determined to crush the American rebellion, and he encouraged a new strategy for victory, which abandoned the focus on New England and instead focused on the South. And the reason for this is it thought it was thought that it would be easier for the crown to recapture the South because of the amount of loyalists that existed there. So the British hoped to recapture the southern colonies one by one, restore the loyalists to power, and then move north um, to the more problematic, you know, middle colonies and saving the, the really the hardest colonies in New England for the last. Georgia was the British first target, and it does easily fall at the end of December of 1778 because most of the Continental Army was actually still back in New York and New Jersey. Um, the next target was South Carolina, which despite the presence of 10 Continental regiments, finally surrendered in May of 1780. So from Charleston, South Carolina, Clinton, General Clinton for the British, announced that slaves owned by rebel masters were welcome to seek refuge with his army and several thousand responded by escaping to the coastal city. The escaped slaves were of immediate use to the British as knowledgeable guides to the surrounding countryside and as laborers in the service to the army, building defensive networks and earthworks and fortifications. Escaped slaves with boat piloting skills were particularly valuable to the British as they navigated the inland river systems of the southern colonies. British General Henry Clinton um, returned to New York, leaving the task of pacifying South Carolina to General Charles Cornwallis and 4,000 troops. So he, again, um, when the British probably should have hunkered down and reinforced um, their troops instead, uh, Clinton leaves and leaves Cornwallis in charge. Um, in August of 1780, the Continental Army was ready to strike back at Cornwallis, and American troops suffered, even though they suffered devastating um, losses in Camden, South Carolina, they continued on. So, although the 
new British strategy was beginning to succeed a little bit. This was due in part because of improved information about American troop movements that was secretly being furnished to the British by Benedict Arnold, a former, well, he was still working for the Americans, um, officer in the Continental Army, the one-time hero of several key battles, in fact. Arnold's um, treasonous plot to deliver West Point, deliver West Point to the British was foiled by the capture of the messenger, carrying plans of the fort's defense from Arnold to General Clinton. And once this becomes clear to everybody that this, you know, famous, uh, you know, uh, American continental officer, Benedict Arnold has turned on the Americans shock at this, um, shock at this treason, um, revitalized actually rebel support in Western South Carolina, an area that Cornwallis had believed to be pacified and loyal. And soon the back country of the South um, became the site of very aggressive guerrilla warfare um, against the British. Um, the British Southern strategy had had relied upon sufficient loyalist strength to hold reconquered territory as the army moved north, but the backcountry civil war proved this assumption false, and the Americans won a few major battles in the south, but they ultimately succeeded by harassing British forces and preventing them from foraging for food. And so ultimately, that Southern strategy that the British had initially succeeded with um, will be foiled, and it will be foiled through guerrilla warfare that the Americans will um, stage against the British um, in the South, in these backcountry areas. And a lot of the reason for that warfare was because people were fired up and angered at the treason that was committed by Benedict Arnold. So here is an image of uh, General Nathaniel Green. Um, he was uh, one of the American generals that was sent to the South, and he was one of the successful ones in helping drive them out of the South and forcing them to retreat to Yorktown, Virginia. All right, thank goodness for maps when we're talking about war. So let's look at this map now. Um, this is basically demonstrating what I was just talking about. So originally um, you had the British came down, they took Savannah um, and they uh, took it uh, in December of 1778. Again, surrendered, surrendered pretty easily, took over the city. Then they moved on to Charleston where there was some fighting, about five weeks of fighting and resistance, but ultimately they will also take Charleston, uh, South Carolina in May of 1780. So things looking pretty good for the British up until this point. Um, Cornwallis then advances his troops into the interior where there will be another major uh, British victory at Camden. Um, and then they continue on. Now this is where things get hairy. As you get into late 1780 and also early 1781, you're starting to see some American victories. Um, and um, ultimately, Cornwallis's army is kind of forced to, you know, scurry about this countryside. And it's decided that they are going to retreat up to Yorktown. Now, Yorktown is a town that is um, in the Chesapeake Bay region, and um, it is a very critical um, area because of its proximity to the, um, the ocean. And so the British were going there basically to resupply. And, um, but what they didn't know was that the Americans and the French uh, were on their way to Yorktown also, and that they were going to attempt to cut off those British supply lines to Cornwallis's army. And in, in addition to that, 
the French Navy was going to fight a big naval battle with the British right here at the mouth of the Chesapeake. That will end up being a French victory. And as a result of that, the British are basically Cornwallis and his army are stuck here at Yorktown. Okay, so this shows the Battle of Yorktown. So let me talk a little bit about the Battle of Yorktown or what comes to be known as the Surrender at Yorktown. So in 1781, Cornwallis, who had been fighting in the South and his troops moved back to North Carolina and then to Virginia, where they achieved minor victories. By the time British ships arrived to defend the Chesapeake Bay, the French fleet was already there. A five-day naval battle left the French Navy in control of the Virginia coast. The French Navy's control of the Chesapeake Bay proved to be the decisive factor in ending the war because it eliminated a water escape route for Cornwallis's land army, which was encamped at Yorktown, and prevented the arrival of British reinforcements. So General Cornwallis and his 7,500 troops now faced a combined <coughs> French and American army that numbered over 16,000, 16,000. So you see here, you have Lafayette, who is a French <coughs> general, excuse me, and Washington and Rochambeau, and they have come down and they have advanced, and they are now hunkering down at uh, at um, Yorktown, basically cutting off all of the supplies. Okay, so if you click on some of those optional video resources, instructor video resources, um, one of the things that is there is a video on the surrender at Yorktown and the Battle of Yorktown generally. Um, but the, the main thing here for us that is important, obviously, is that this is the final official battle of the American Revolutionary War and that Cornwallis is forced to surrender, um, being cut off from any of supply lines and support by the French and the Americans. At Yorktown, there was a big display of defiance by the British against the Americans. Um, in fact, uh, General Cornwallis refused to come out and surrender, um, and instead he decided to send his second in command um, to surrender for him. Um, and in response to that, George Washington actually sent his second in command to accept the surrender. So what you see here in this very famous painting by George, uh, John Trumbull is uh, you have here on the left, you have the French officers. Um, you have here on the right, um, the American officers. Um, and then you have here in, uh, in the center, this is George Washington's second General Benjamin Lincoln. Uh, this George Washington actually stays back um, on his horse because General Cornwallis has refused to come out and s surrender to him personally. So obviously, I mean, this is, you know, a lot of sort of pomp and display and whatever, but these were very um, solemn things. These were very official ceremonies. And so for the British to not even acknowledge um, by sending their commanding officer out um, the surrender it was a very, it was a big, big snub um, at the Americans. And it kind of foreshadows things to come because you really get the sense after the American Revolution that despite the fact that the Americans win independence from the British Empire, the British kind of think that this is just a temporary thing. Um, they don't have a lot of confidence um, that the American colonies will be successfully able to um, sustain and support their own independent country. And that's why um, the War of 1812, which is another war that we will later on fight with the British and of course talk about in this class, 
um, is seen as kind of the second revolutionary war because the British really never kind of really never gave up on um, the American colonies. And they certainly didn't give up their presence in North America until after the War of 1812. But of course, this is a huge victory for the Americans. The Battle of Yorktown, the surrender of Yorktown, um, provides the basis for the end to the Revolutionary War. And it will be followed by a treaty. Um, and this treaty will be signed by three parties, um, England, France, and America. And this is the Treaty of Paris of 1783. What does the Treaty of Paris of 1783 do? Uh, England is forced to recognize the colony's independence as the United States of America. The western boundary of the country is going to be defined by the Mississippi River. So basically, um, all the way from the eastern seaboard to the Mississippi River is the east-west boundary of the new country. All refugees that had been with the British for more than a year were issued certificates of freedom. So if you were an African-American enslaved person that went to fight for the British during the Revolutionary War, if you had fought for, with, for them for uh, more than a year, you were issued certificates of freedom. And as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the uh, war lectures, I talked about how 10,000 uh, African Americans from the American colonies will end up um, either being sent to Canada or to Sierra Leone in Africa. Um, and finally, and also a very important point, is that Indians, Native American groups, were excluded from all negotiations at the end of this war. Um, and their land was totally given over to the Americans, right? So um, that land that existed that was on the other side of the proclamation line that had been set aside as an Indian reserve is now going to be open for settlement. Um, and American um, Americans are gonna begin to move into those frontiers areas in greater, greater numbers. So this has a lot of significance, right, for a lot of different groups, right? You've got obviously the colonists. If you are somebody living in the colonies now, you are no longer a colonist. You are now part of the United States of America and the work of forming a new government is going to begin. If you are an African-American, enslaved person that had fought for the British Army, you are now leaving the colonies and either going to Canada or Africa. Um, if you are a Native American, you are left in the uh, destruction of the Revolutionary War, perhaps having new enemies, uh, Native American tribal enemies, and also faced with the prospect that, you know, settlers are going to begin to come into your territories. Um, so this had a lasting consequences. Um, it also, of course, creates um, a, an alliance between uh, America and France, um, which is important when we think about uh, France as they go into their revolution. Um, that is, you know, going to start pretty soon. It starts in 1789. So, um, so that's important too, and that will become part of some of the early political divisions in American politics, which we will talk about in future lectures. So that is all. Um, let me know if you have any questions about the American Revolution, and I will see you next time for chapter six. Have a good one.